Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Alec Mappa Hot Mess with Matthew Dempsey, psychotherapist. I'm Alec Mappa. I'm an actor and comedian. I live in Hollywood, and nobody knows I'm gay. <laughs> <laughs> well, today is the day. I'm Matthew Dempsey. I'm a multicultural counselor and a psychotherapist. Can you imagine this being in the closet? Like, <laughs> what did that look like? Um, it looked like a very frightened teenager. Yeah. It looked like I was out in school. Mm -hmm. Like, like in high school, I was out freshman year. I was, uh, I had boyfriends, but I wasn't out at home. Right. And I wasn't, and it was at the time, it, it was happening at the same time that my parents were having financial difficulties. Mm -hmm. So I was the last of their priorities. They were just kind of like trying to rebuild from the ground up. So I was kind of on my own, but I didn't formally come out to them until like my freshman year of college. Oh, wow. Okay. So it's like, they were just so preoccupied with other things that they weren't even paying yeah, attention too much. They knew. <laughs> I mean, my mom knew my mom, my mom, even before I came out to her formally, I remember this one time we were in an ice cream parlor and the guy behind the counter thought it was cute. Yeah. And he was like, what do you want? And I was like, well, what do you want? <laughs> and he was like, well, what do you like? You know, and I went back and forth like this until I finally decided on vanilla. And, and you were uh, eight? Uh, yeah, I was eight years old. <laughs> and we were leaving. And my mother, I think I was 16, 15. And my mother said to me, you are so obvious. No, really? Yeah, yeah. Oh my God, that's so brilliant. It was like, did you come out to your mom or your dad first? Uh, I came out to my dad first. Um, I had pretty much come out. It's so interesting because I hear this all the time where you would think the logic is that you would come out to the people that you're closest to first and then you yes. kind of like the ripple effect outward, but it's yes. the reverse. Like you come out to people that you kind of like a little bit know, more know, your closest friends, some yeah. of your family members, and then your the parents, right? The safety zone, you're building the safety yes, belt. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Because it's lesser risk on the outside so you get to practice that. So mm -hmm. anyway, I came out to my dad first. I mean, mostly because he actually kind of like over a couple of years before I came out, he kept questioning things and I'd be like, I'm not gay and would like storm off. Um, and then eventually he, he I'm asked- I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. Yeah. I'm gonna go <laughs> to my room and bite my pillow. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and there was one time actually, so I had already come out to myself and was dating and I had my first boyfriend and I called my dad, I didn't live with my dad, but I called him up and I just said, hey, you know, I was thinking about coming down and visiting, maybe I'd come over for dinner. And he's like, oh, that's great. And I was like, maybe I could bring my friend. And he's like, okay, who's your friend? And I was like, oh, his name's Dave. And he was just like, oh, a guy. And I was just like, yeah, he's just my friend. And he's like, oh, okay. And I'm like, is there a problem? He's like, well, no, I mean, if it was a... He's like, is the, if it was like a girl, like if it was like a girl and like a love interest, then, you know, like that would make sense. But like, you can bring your friend if you'd like to. And I said, well, what if it was a love interest, dad? And he oh, goes- confrontational. Yeah, I know, like 17 years old. And wow. so he was just like, well, then it would be a different story. And I was like, well, it is. And he goes, well, now you're telling me this big phone over the, new, uh, big news over the phone. And I was like, well, if you weren't Nancy Drew about it, I could have just brought him down and introduced him, yeah. but okay. So I'm curious, like, were you closer to your, are you closer to your dad or your mom? Uh, I'm close. I'm closer to each of them in very different ways, but I'm, mm. I would say I'm closer to my mom mostly because I just lived with her growing up. So right. it was like that day to day kind of like closeness that was there. And okay. then, so I came out to my mom second, again, just because like I was probably like closest to her and also still lived with her. Yes. And, but it was eventually one day I just thought, you know, Matt, just fucking tell her now. If you tell her now, then everybody knows you don't have to hide it from anyone anymore. This was so when was you had 17. a boyfriend already and you were all set up and yeah, you were like, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think? I'm curious. What do you, what do you looking back? I mean, even for you coming out like as early as you did, that's really early, especially when you were coming out. That's like yeah. really early. Yeah. Isn't it? Wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it wasn't hard for you. Uh, you know what? Sexually, I think sexually it wasn't hard for me. I knew what I liked. I'd yeah. been like a very kind of sexually precocious kid. Uh -huh. You know, I went to a lot of makeout parties and <laughs> eighth grade. And did you ever do those? <laughs> yeah. With, Girl, at that point with girls, with girls with yeah girls yeah i'd go to make out parties with girls and then it was it wasn't a very big shift to kind of like be making out with a guy like uh -huh. after i made out with a guy in freshman year of high school i felt like okay well then i've always been doing this oh my god but, really but hold on the first time i ever made out with a guy i remember my whole like chin and and mouth area were so like just tender and raw because of like yeah. the stubble yeah. i'm like oh my god it is so different kissing men <laughs> but nice Oh, it's great. I loved it. But it was, it was not, nice. the, for me, it wasn't the same thing. Yeah. I remember the very first time I kissed a guy and this is unbelievable. I just remember this sensation. I haven't felt it in a while. <laughs> I remember feeling like tingling in the soles of my feet. 
yeah. when he kissed me. I was just oh. kind of like, Whoa. this is and what I, it's like. Yeah, and I really, really liked it, but I felt like sexually, physically, I was kind of like out and out to my friends and everything, but I wasn't secure enough in a place. I don't, I didn't have a secure attachment with my parents. Mm -hmm. I, I always felt I was loved conditionally. Okay. You know, if you get good yeah. grades, if you perform well, if you did, right. I didn't have that core of you guys are going to love me no matter what. So that was the trepidation with me as, right. as effeminate as I was, as gay presenting as I was, the fear, the essential fear was um, uh, you guys are going to ostracize me and I'm never going to see you again. Yeah. Even yeah. though that never happened and, and knowing my parents now, it wouldn't have happened. Mm -hmm. But my father had a terrible temper growing up. I didn't want to be the object of that. And, right. um, but yeah, no. And it's just kind of like, and then after I came out, it was no big deal. And then I was really super militant when I came out. I find uh, that militant I was, how? I was kind of humorless about it. It was kind of oh. like no gay jokes, like man, oh. like, you know, <laughs> oh, yeah. Pride is really important. Yeah, I'm pride. <laughs> nah. You know. Yeah, I mean, freedom listen. rings. Do you remember freedom rings? They were like a little. Oh, what the hell are freedom rings? And, and they were like, um, they had like it was in the colors of the rainbow flag, oh. like little rings on a chain. Yes. That was oh, really so you had those? Yeah. Oh, okay. You know what's really interesting <laughs> that there is that there's a. Uh, there's a theoretical model, a, a theoretical stage model of development for a kind of queer identity, specifically like gay identity. Oh, I didn't know. Yes, and so there are uh, the different stages. It's like I identity confusion, identity comparison, tolerance, acceptance, pride, and then synthesis. I think I might be missing one. Pride uh, and then self-disgust. Right, no. <laughs> Oh, that's too true, true. My friend, no, my friend Suzanne no, no, Westhoffer yeah. has this joke at the end of Pride. You know, it's almost the end of Pride. And I got to be honest with you, not so proud. <laughs> <laughs> but so it's Pride and then synthesis. So Pride okay. meaning like when you come out and you're like, yes, I'm gay and everything yeah. is gay and this is yeah. how it should be. And everybody look at me. And then you eventually get to a place where you hopefully are able to integrate it into your being. But hmm. interesting that we're talking about what we're talking about today because that's a whole fucking process. And I mean, even for, mm. it sounds like for, bo for both of us, we both had relatively pleasant experiences coming out, right? Like it wasn't yeah, easy, no, but I wasn't relatively kicked out pleasant of the house. Experience. I wasn't shut off, yeah. Right, it wasn't super traumatic to, mm -hmm. that, to that degree. But even in a situation like this, where it's kind of more of the ideal situation, it still has a very significant lasting impact on our psychology, on, mm. our, on the way we feel, the way that we understand ourselves, the way we mm -hmm. move through the world. Being closeted like that for so long, you're hiding who you are. We were hiding who we were. Yeah. And what that does to us and the way that we you know, kind of feel about ourselves and how Burdensome. we value ourselves. Burdensome. Yeah, yeah, that even after we come out of the closet, we still have to we still have to deal with that. We still have to contend with that because it still shows up in our lives. I think I'm at the synthesis age because I don't really think about it anymore. I mean, it's kind of yeah. like my friends who are trans, they're like, everybody always focuses on our transition story instead right. of the day-to-day -day thing. And I've, you know, my son is in the very militant stage right now. All of his, really? me and all of his friends who are trans and queer, they're like, these are my pronouns and I'm pan <laughs> and I'm demi. Like they're like totally, <laughs> yes. do you know what demisexual is? Uh, oh no, what's demisexual? demisexual? I should know this, oh my God. Yeah, you're, yeah, nice thing. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a fraud. Yeah, you're not seeing any young people, apparently. <laughs> demisexual is like, you can only have sex or be romantically involved with people that you feel romantic about. Like you feel oh. emotional about, like you feel an emotional oh, kind of. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm demi, I'm demi preferred, but not, not exclusive. Oh, really? Yeah, I prefer to have a, I prefer to have an emotional connection with somebody. I feel like the sex is really good that way. I'd rather not. Really? <laughs> <laughs> I have a husband for emotional connection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I want to just kind of like, it's been, a, having said that, it's been a really long time since I hit it and quit it. Where yeah. I'm kind of like, yeah. Because that's, <laughs> if, if I'm I do enjoy, I do enjoy anonymous sex though, I do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's been a while. It's been a while with the <laughs> pandemic and everything. Just yes, kind of, of listen. Course. 
before we go off on any tangents, you're right. um, if you're new to the podcast, please download and subscribe. We're so happy to have you here. Yes. Uh, we've had amazing guests. We've had Trixie Mattel and Sandra Bernhardt and Isaac Mizrahi and pretty much the entire cast of every single season of RuPaul's Drag Race. We are the, <laughs> we are the psychological way station for every single queen who's been on the show. So yes. download and subscribe. And today, Matt, so excited. Me Do you too. know who our guest is? Yeah, Cynthia. Cynthia Lee Fontaine, one of the uh, favorite drag queens that's ever been on the series. She's going to be on the day to talk about her closeted journey. You may know her from seasons eight and nine of RuPaul's Drag Race. She's an artist and a singer and an HIV advocate for the queer community. She refers to herself as a queen for the people. And she wants to show you her cuckoo. Please welcome <laughs> Cynthia Lee Fontaine. Yay. Yay. Hello, guys. How are you? We're good. Okay. Good. Hey, hey, hey. You've been holding out on us. Not only are you an activist, but you have a degree in clinical psychology. What? Wow. Yes, uh, I study a bachelor in clinical psychology. Also, I'm a caseworker for HIV clients who experience mental health issues or substance use abuse too as well. I've been doing that for almost nine years in Austin, Texas, where I live. Oh, so I yeah, love that. I are love you a, that. are you a social worker? Did you get a master's in social work or just a mass uh, uh, bachelor's in clinical psychology? Well, just only the bachelor's degree. I was about to study my master's degree, but they called me for a cast for a season eight of RuPaul Drag Race. Oh, so wow. Drag Race has stopped a little bit, in my, you know, my psychology <laughs> journey into yes. going through this, like, you know, quick <laughs> journey. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Matthew, can you imagine uh, going in and having your caseworker be Cynthia Lee Fontaine? Oh my God, I would love that. Yes, I can't imagine that. Hello, how are you? This is Cynthia Lee Fontaine. I'm going to analyze your cook. Oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> So, Cynthia, are you currently doing that in Austin, Texas right now? Are you currently working as a, a caseworker for HIV AIDS? Mm -hmm. Well, at the moment, you know, I've been like focusing since five years ago on my career as an entertainer, reality TV star and singer. When I have the opportunity, I always volunteer. But I mean, like 100% fully focused on my entertainment career. But yes, when we have like all the events, benefit events in Austin, Texas for ASA Austin or Community AIDS Resources and Education, which is the agency that I used to work before 100% full and uh, full time. I always go and I say like, hey, my cook is ready, you know, to support and, you know, to help the community. Mm. Wow. So wait, wait, I'm so I'm curious and then we'll move on just because I love I love hearing about a, a honk of somebody's life that we've never heard about before. Mm -hmm. So when you were a caseworker. All right. Let's say I come to you. It, is it people who are being diagnosed with HIV for the very first time and you kind of walk them through next steps? What did you do? Well, actually, in my case, not just only like give them like all the steps and all the resources, you know, for linkage to medical services, or even maybe probably like, like low income resources too, as housing, transportation help. Actually, I'm a outreach worker. So I do the HIV tests to these individuals. If they result, you know, confirmatory results, I send that to a lab and we have the confirmatory results. And then that's how I get the case. And I give like the first assessment, you know, Hey, mm -hmm. um, oh. we're less face, you know, you are like right now HIV positive. Let's work through that. How do you feel? How is going to be the process after I'm going to help you to all the entire process. And then I, I link it with medical services, infectologists, you know, and other like, you know, medical doctors too as well. Linkage with medications too as well. And also like whatever, anything else that they need as a resources. And then after six months, I leave them, you know, like, Wow. running by themselves yeah. you know so it's like the first assessment like how to face this diagnosis and also all the resources that we can provide yeah. to help them through this transition yeah cynthia my actually my very first counseling job ever was at gay men's health crisis and was a test counselor and did uh, a lot of similar oh, work wow. yeah a lot of similar work and so really my first experience in counseling anybody was doing exactly this kind of walking them through pre and post test and doing the test and having to be there for the emotional support so i'm curious for your experience what what was like what was that like for you having kind of like your counseling experience being right, specifically right. around HIV? Because it sounds like you're counseling somebody at a, at a time where they're super vulnerable, yes, and frightened. I would imagine. Yes. Well, you know, 
us as a providers, as a facilitators, it's a very difficult situation because you have to give a very, you know, drastic 365 degrees change news, you know? So it's, it's very difficult, but at the same time, you need to prepare yourself with all the tools as, mm -hmm. a, as a facilitator, mm -hmm. just to try to make it impossible to make the process more understandable. But however, till today, 2021, we still people that get traumatized by this union news. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's just try to go and peer with the client, with the individual, you know, like I'm here to help you. Uh -huh. If you want to cry, you can cry. If you're going to scream, you can scream. Right. This is a safe space for you to express yourself. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I offer them if they want to like, you know, counseling, you know, or any like, you know, psychological or, you know, any like therapy counseling or group counseling too as well. As a part of the package that I provide for all the clients to try to make it impossible to make this process easiest and smooth as possible. Yeah. Oh, wow. I love that. I love that. That It wasn't like that back in, I'm old. So I, my first <laughs> test was in 1987. <laughs> and I remember the doctor saying to me, well- I didn't know you were old. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, she's been around. Um, I just got microneedling this week, though, so I they looking very I watched that on Instagram. You look beautiful. Um, oh. No, my, I remember my <laughs> clinician telling me at 1987, well, you had unsafe sex in San Francisco, so you should be prepared to hear that you're positive. Wow, yeah. There was no, there was no kind of like that oh, wow. was that was his thing, and this was back in the day. It wasn't an instant swab. You had to wait two weeks for the results. Wow. And then, so after two weeks, I called in and they said, we have to do it again. There was a problem with your blood. We have, so no. I had to wait another two weeks uh, the trauma. to get my results. Yeah. How terrifying is that? Yeah. <laughs> wow. You know, back in the days, the type of HIV um, test, it was just only one generation. That means that it takes like forever to get the mm -hmm. codification of the virus of the blood system. And also to see the CD4 cells too as well. It was two different types of labs. You know, mm -hmm. so if one of those, they came incorrect, that what happened to you, like, hey, you know what, let's poke you again. You know, we like you, you're so cute and funny, let's poke you again, <laughs> because we don't have something, you know. See, if uh, the doctor had been like you, oh, I would have been so mystery more relaxed. <laughs> Well, you know, the thing right now so far is the Department of Health and CDC and especially, you know, like all the education, HIV prevention programs in all the entire United States through HIPAA law. They give this, and you know, training to mm. all of us, peer support specialists, caseworker, outreach worker, every single member who works for HIV prevention program and education to us to give like a good assessment, like a, like give that first interview to the client, you know, that is gonna be like as smooth and easy going as possible for them. Yeah. Back in the days, everything yeah. was new. You know, it was uh, the gay cancer, you yeah. know, they, they miss calling, yeah. you know, and it was mm -hmm. terrifying, for, not just only for the gay community, it was terrifying for the rest of the society too as well. So yeah. now we mm -hmm. have to, you know, follow those steps in order that we can facilitate a very more reasonable and more smooth process to the clients to know the results. Yeah, and we're in such a great place now where obviously testing is so much quicker. There's so many more resources that are available, so much more treatment that's available. But even still, so much of it is around stigma and the emotional experience from going, you know, before you tested positive yes. to after you tested positive. And so it's kind of overall what we're talking about today, which is really about that experience, whatever it is, if it's HIV, if it's coming out, if it's coming out as, you know, in drag, um, about how the experience kind of leading up to it uh, can affect us after after we come out. So I'm just kind of curious, can you tell us a little bit about your experience uh, as before you came out and kind of what that was like? Right, because looking at you now, you would think, how could she have ever been in the closet? And you have a very interesting <laughs> story to share today. Well, actually, like you guys, I've been listening to your stories already. That's amazing that you get the opportunity, you know, to expose yourself, your sexuality, your sexual orientation. In my case, I was in the closet. I started doing drag and it was like almost a year myself. I was like, you know, visiting like all the gay bars yeah. and being cute and kissing boys and <laughs> kissing girls still and, how old were you? and going okay. around. That period of time, I was 25. Okay. Yeah. Yes, I was 25. So we, I, I'm a late bloomer, you know, mm -hmm. like 
coming out of the closet, like I said, I never came out of the closet. I'm going to explain to you why. Okay. So in 2006, I got the opportunity. I used to live with my sister. My mm -hmm. sister knew my secret. You know mm -hmm. that? I mean, all this, everybody yes. knows. <laughs> but the thing is, like, she was my confident and she knew my secret. And it was her graduation for her bachelor's degree in business administration. Okay. My mom came to visit. And she stayed in my room. Oh. Of course, Latino moms, they open everything. They open the closets. <laughs> oh, no. If you know what I said, if yeah. you know what I mean. Literally they and open figuratively. the suitcase. <laughs> they check underneath the bed, you mm -hmm. know, for maybe probably <laughs> prophylactics, a.k.a. condoms or more, if I was doing babies or not. Yeah. And <laughs> she found out a suitcase that I was using back in the days to put all my drag, uh -huh. all my wig. Uh, okay. And all my, like she called in Spanish, parafernalia, you know, mm. all the glamorous, you know, transformation for Cynthia. <laughs> and still today, she's like, oh, I love your parafernalia, mi ha ha ha. You know? <laughs> and me, I came back from work. I used to work in a hospital, finishing yes. my bachelor's degree too. Um, medical record department, we used to like with papers back in the days. Thanks God for iPads. Anyway. So the thing is, like, she was in bed with the suitcase open, <gasps> and she was like, Who's so you're this? gay? Uh, yes. Like, my mom was, like, crying. The suitcase was next to her, all open. It was my titties, a.k.a. tetas, my wig, and my costume for that weekend performance. Oh, wow. And <laughs> What's she was response? like, so I have to find out things that you're gay and you dress as a woman. Yeah. Mm, she was crying. Okay. It was very tough for her. She was like, mm. oh, my God. And it was funny because she saw a picture, too. And she was like, oh, my God. So you dress as a woman. You're beautiful. You look like your sister and me. But, oh, my God, what are you going to tell me? <laughs> um, you know? And, Cynthia, like, and, and, Cynthia, like, okay, like, you're uh, you're describing a scene where she's upset and she's crying. And knowing your mom now, because you guys are cool now, what was she crying about in the moment, do you think? Knowing, knowing the, what you know of your mother, what was she crying about in that moment? Was it the shock well, of the new? Well, after the conversations that we have and after the process for us to re-engage, mm -hmm. you know, on the relationship, like son, mother, she was explaining to me, it wasn't that you were gay. I did not have any problem with your sexual orientation. Actually, since you were a kid, um, she told me a story when I was in kindergarten and I kissed a boy, you mm -hmm. know, in a play that we were doing, you know, Red Riding Hood, you know, I'm mm -hmm. like, oh, okay, okay. She remembered things, that's <laughs> okay. good, you know? She feel betrayed because she thought that we were friends and I betrayed her friendship and I didn't tell her the truth. And I was hiding this truth from her. That yeah. was the main issue. Yeah, right. yeah. And in my head, you know, I'm 40 years old, you know, you can notice because all my doctors are doing a great and amazing <laughs> job, honey. But... You know, back in the days, and still in Puerto Rico, especially in the Hispanic demographic, in the Hispanic society, there's still stigma. There's still like yeah, a little yeah. bit of like, you know, cons very conservative and very traditional, you know, standards on society. Mm -hmm. You know, still today, 2021, back in the days, it used to be like super, super rough. Like even myself, for become a drag queen, it was like, no, mm -hmm. I'm not yeah. going to dress as a woman. No, I'm a masculine, yeah. very <laughs> heterosexual, like homosexual man. I'm not going to do that. And look at me now. Yeah. So you're, <laughs> saying, you're saying the Puerto Rican culture did not kind of have room for you to be yourself growing up? Or do you feel like that was with your mother? Did you not feel? Because my next question is, what if your mother felt betrayed, what what was the thing that kept you from telling her? Was it your culture? Well, actually, for me, it was like more family, um, you know, like statements and situation. Mm. Half of my family is Catholic and half of my family is Seventh-day Adventist Church. Oh. And actually, me, myself, back in the days, I have two gospel albums. I was very active into the Seventh-day Adventist Church, you mm. know, um, like very active member of the church. And uh, me, like coming out and expressing myself, me, my sexuality, it was very tough because already I knew, you know, what was the religious beliefs from my family. 
But at the same time, it was like fears. I was like, just like, you know, fighting with my giants in my head of mm. the stigma and discrimination that I built up myself. Mm. Because as soon as my family knew, everybody was like hugging me, supporting me, saying like, we love you the way that you are. You're an amazing individual, Carlos. And whatever you want to dress, if you want to dress like, you know, like Wanda or Belinda, we love you so very much. Yeah. And we know the type of individual and adult you become. We Beautiful. love you, and this is a, a family of love and support. So don't you being afraid for this stigma that society predisposed right. in your mind, it's mm. incorrect because us in our family, we love you, and we're going to love you forever, and we're going to support you forever. Yeah. So it was me in my head and my 75 voices in my head telling me, no, <laughs> don't come out to your family. Yeah, but I also, <laughs> lo I also love specifically what your family said, which is they acknowledge the fact that there's a societal impact, right? Like that they can acknowledge that there's internalized homophobia, queerphobia that happens to us where it does create those voices. It's not like we just make them up, right? It's because of the world yes. that we live in. Um, but also acknowledging that it's not a problem for them and that it was so that they were happy that you were able to come out. I guess I'm just kind of curious on the, on the timeline of it. Did you, did you come out to yourself like first as, uh, as, as gay did, like what, how, how do you identify and, and when did you come up um, with an understanding of those? Well, um, Already in 2006, I was living a lifestyle as, you know, part of the gay community, you know. Mm -hmm. oh, I was, um, you know, freak, like frequently going to the gay bars and even like I went to gay prides too. But for that period of time, 2006, I went already to three gray, gray prides in Puerto Rico, you know. Mm -hmm. So I was identifying myself. I knew who I was. It was just only like me, my fear to right. come out of the closet, you know. And uh, something, Matthew, and, and you, um, Alec, that you were telling, come on, Doc. Rawr. Yeah, oh, it's Sydney. my dog. I'm sorry. <laughs> this is the same yeah. dog that- It's likes, our third host. Yeah. This is dog oh, that he... snored through Miss Coco's near-death experience <laughs> interview. Hold on. I love that. That's a, that's a real homosexual. I love that. Yes, doggy. You know? <laughs> yeah. Jesus Christ. <laughs> it's All part right. of the community. Yeah. I just know. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I want to answer something real quick. Um, I think Puerto Rican society and also the Hispanic community in general, is, it has a repertoire, you know, like we said in French, like that opening a little bit more for the queer, the queer community. Mm. And that's beautiful. That's really good. You know, back in the days, it used to be rough. But now we have the opportunity, like me, myself, maybe probably I can stop by in a gas station in Puerto Rico like this. And people is going to be, instead of like, ew, ooh, look at that gay, or maybe mm -hmm. probably slangs, you know, derogatory words. They're going to be like, oh my God, I love your makeup, mija, que bonita tu eras, you're so beautiful. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. But it's still, you know, in baby steps, you know, for acceptance, for yes. this queer diversity that, yes. that still like exists and it's gonna be forever here. And it's nothing to worry about, you know? We are beautiful, we're gorgeous, this is who we are and we need to yeah. be proud of it. Totally, yeah, and of course that's a process, as is coming out. I always kind of get flustered a little bit, it takes me a minute when people say like, when did you come out? Because it's a little bit like, well, what does that mean? I don't know, I came out to myself at a certain age, I came out to friends at a different time, I came out to my family at a different time, you know, I came out publicly. To, so, you know, it's it's such kind of a, a, a process and, and different stages. When, when was it that you were um, acknowledging for yourself and coming out just even to yourself? I think it was the moment that I started dr uh, doing drag for oh, myself. Wow. You know, mm. like I started doing the, this Cynthia. Yeah. Um, I think to artistry, I found that myself the validation of like, hey, you're gay, you're part of this community. Look yeah. at you. And it was, I remember the first day that I performed, it was a, it was a horrible wig. It was a, a $25 two dress that I wear. I did a <laughs> lip sync. I grabbed the microphone. I did the host of my life. And I see the acceptance and I see the love and support of the community. I'm like, yeah. you know what? I do not need to deny my femininity. Yeah. I need to express it. Let her out. Let her be. And also that made me, you know, um, you know, verbalize and, you know, make more visible my sexual orientation as a gay, mar and gay man, part of the community. So right. I think that was the moment that I realized, like, girl. Hello, yeah. you like yeah. boys, boys like you. <laughs> yeah. We've interviewed a lot of queens on the show and a common theme seems to be like their drag persona empowers them. 
and throughout the rest of their life. And RuPaul has said that her therapist said to her that the power you can access in drag, you could access in your life out of drag as well. Yes. Um, I, I'm always curious, um, who is who is Cynthia? Where does she come from? Is she is she based on a relative? Is she based mm, on the women in your community that you grew up watching? Well, I'm gonna have a good tea for you guys. It, it, it better be hot, okay? Okay. <laughs> Cynthia, my first name, yes. is one of my best friends that actually I fall in love. A real female, a real pageant girl from Puerto Rico, actress and advocate for, um, you know, breast cancer in Puerto Rico, Cynthia Olavarria. She's first runner up at Miss Universe 2005. Wow. Yes. And, you know, uh, uh, even it was a beautiful connection, but at the same time, she was like, I'm going to be very honest with you, Carlos. I think like what you feel towards me is this admiration because you see me as an uh, idol uh, okay. because there's something uh. on that feminine side that you want to expose yourself and you right, want to explore. Right. And it's not attraction. So wow. let's be friend Pinky Promise forever, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to Google amazing. her now. Yeah. So it's based on a Miss Universe. That's so awesome. Yes, you know, I'm a pageant girl, you know, to yeah. be very honest with you. And I work for the Miss Universe Puerto Rico organization for five years. Yeah. It was a great experience, too, because I get to get close into that side and have to, you know, how to walk. How yeah. to model, how to yeah. do makeup, how to do hair. You know, that my best build friends up the is character a, that I have as an entertainer today. One of my best friends is a former Miss Universe, uh, Brooke Lee. She was from Hawaii. She was Miss USA. And she oh! won in 97, 96. Yeah, she like likes that. to eat everything. I remember. Oh, okay, see, she has, she likes you're to a total eat pageant in hag. The world. This yeah. is what, okay, Matthew, <laughs> I have to fill Matthew in because yeah. he's. During okay, the fact that she could quote a Miss Universe from nine from the nineties, this was her question in her in her final answer. In it, it, this was back uh, the former Miss Universe the year before her it was Miss Spain and she gained all this weight and it was uh -huh. really controversial and Trump had called her Miss Piggy, oh. and so when Brooke my friend was was asking George Hamilton asked her on the stage if there were no rules for one day what would you do. And she said, I would eat everything oh. twice. <laughs> <laughs> I, will, I will eat everything in the world, you know? Yeah, everything yeah. in the world. Yeah. Alec, Alec, I'm going to interrupt you. It okay. was in Spain. It was Venezuela. Alicia Venezuela. Machado. Venezuela. Uh, yeah. Okay, okay. See? Got it. She won, I stand corrected. She, she gained um, 30 pounds. I, re I remember. I remember. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> but I'm... I will never forget like Brooke with that answer. And she bring this, it break the stereotype, you know, of yeah. the pageants like yeah. war piece. No, she was yeah. honest. She was hungry all the moment. I want to eat everything in all the entire world. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> she's like the anti-beauty queen, beauty queen. Like she swears like a sailor. She's hilarious. I'm going to introduce you when you come to LA. Um, so uh, Cynthia, you, like your mom has gone above and beyond crying in a hotel room and discovering your wigs. She is now an advocate for you and has written a book. Is that true? Is that that's correct? My, my mom is writing a book, like her experience, um, actually, like telling you know, uh, uh, we all know, you know, we all uh, express and verbalize our own experience, how we get out of the closet, you know, how we expose our sexuality, but we never heard before parents, siblings, talking about having the opportunity to see a queer member of, her, of their family coming out of the closet. Okay. So my mom, my mom once with this book, you know, expressed her testimony, how she came out too of the closet with me on this journey, on this experience. So that's what she's writing right now. The book is very interesting, you know. I think maybe probably like next year is going to be ready, you know, looking for publisher and everything mm -hmm. and we don't want to sell in that book everywhere. And I think it's because she feels still today. People need to see the other side of the coin. People need to see the other side, like how the parents feel, mm -hmm. how the parents process yeah. all this entire, you know, um, a, a scenario of knowing, you know, the sexual orientation of a sibling, of a son, of a daughter, mm -hmm. you know? And I think that's the main message. And for her to empathize with other parents and other siblings in the world, like, hey, you're not alone on this. Yes. Yeah. I've been through this journey. I hope my testimony help you 
through go step by step and you get acceptance and love in your family where you're a queer member of your family. Yeah, I love that. I remember I remember shortly after, maybe a year or two after I had come out to my mom, uh, a close friend of mine was having issues coming out with his mom and I was telling my mom about it and she goes, you know, I, we, I understand that this is a very difficult thing. This is your life. This is you coming out. She said, you also have to remember that you have had so many years to be able to sort through all this, process this, mm. get to a place where you could come out and then you come out and, and it feels like the expectation is you're, you know, as a parent, you're just supposed to be right there exactly where you are. And we haven't had time to digest it, you know, that there hasn't been space for that. So, you know, don't forget to we <laughs> offer forget, a little bit of grace. Yeah. We forget yes. that the people we come out to also have a process. Yes. And I think that's yes. like when we come out, we are feeling so strong and so empowered and that's the militant phase. And yeah. I think sometimes the expectation is unfair of like what you said, Matthew, that you should be in the space that I am now. Now. right like yeah. it my dad yes. was accepting right away but it took a really long time for him to be like out because you they're outed too and right. it yes. changed for him yes. when i became a very public person and i'm sure yeah. for your family cynthia it changed yes. for them you being a very public person oh, yes and also when i get the opportunity to get cast for season eight of rupaul drag race my mom had a conversation with me and she was like, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm a little bit nervous because mm -hmm. now you're going to expose more publicly, internationally. Mm -hmm, Even in right. Puerto Rico, I was a well-known, you know, activist for the, you know, um, the transgender community and HIV community. Understood. It's going to be like international. I'm going to yeah. be exposing my lifestyle to the world. And I'm like, you know what? I'm ready. I'm ready. But in that process and that period of time, I asked her the question, are you ready to as well? Mm. And she told me, if you're ready, mijo, I'm going to be ready too, oh. you know? And I mean, uh, also right now, that. she's mother cuckoo to all the fans uh. and all the fans <laughs> message her. Yeah. And she give advice to everybody, you know? And also the book that she's writing to is to get advice to those who are in the closet or this new generation that is coming out, you know, from the queer yeah. community, how right. to be patient and give advice, how to deal with siblings and parents, you know, and family yeah. members to be more understanding and more tolerable too. So uh, they can work in the same page and together they can live a beautiful life of love and acceptance. Uh, do we have a working title for the book? Is it called Mother Cuckoo Knows? Well, I can tell you, but you will laugh. <laughs> it's, called, it's called One but, Flew yeah, Over the Cuckoo's Dress. <laughs> You're welcome. Memoirs of my cuckoo. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Okay, we need to copyright that. Oh, let me talk with your yeah, lawyers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Cynthia, now you're, it, we're coming out of the pandemic and people are starting to stick a towel in the water in terms of uh, um, uh, performing again. Are you hitting the road again? Are you getting out there? Actually, yes. For the very first time um, this next weekend in Dallas, I'm going to be having a brunch. That's going to be my first in-person performance oh, wow. after a year and two months not oh. going out nowhere. I'm yeah. performing from home because this is my living room area, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'm a little bit, you know, I'm excited. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm a little bit nervous yeah. because, you know, it's, it's coming back into the, you know, interaction, social interaction, you know? And, but at the same time, I'm a queen of the people. I like to, I like to touch everybody's cuckoo and, you know, yeah. being called like you're crazy and, and hug, you know, because that human contact, that human touch right now so far is well needed, to be yeah. very honest with you. Yeah. So I'm excited. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think there's a core of goodness about you that people connect with. I remember yes. this season, there, you had such positivity for everybody and you didn't play a dirty game. I think that you really charmed everyone during your two seasons. Thank you. Thank yeah. you so much. I think it's like, you know, the love and support for my family is my fate, you know, that strength, that positive energy that come from my heart, it always comes from a place of like, you know, really difficult experiences and really beautiful experiences. Mm -hmm. And just like see, you know, everything happened for a reason. And that's how I build up with this positive energy, you know, like even when I go social media, I can be shady with other queens or shady right. with right. fans right. that are a little bit queen. rude, you know, some of them. Mm -hmm. No, I'm just need to share love. And that's the only thing that we need right now so far in this 2021. 
Yeah, totally. I was actually just, I was just thinking that about you is that in, in just this conversation with you is that you have so much, you have so much personality and you're so fun to talk to, but you're also, you have such a depth of, of who you you are in sincerity and just like kindness. It's just so like lovely and refreshing. Thank She's you. She's soulful, Matthew. Yeah, she is. Soulful. Thank she you. Is the queen of the people. Thank now, you. Now, um, we always end our, your delight and we want to talk to you forever, but we're coming to the end of our program. And, um, what uh, what is your uh, you're somebody who lives authentically now if you you know and you're a counselor so we always end with a hot mm -hmm. message if you were to counsel somebody who has a, who's having trouble living authentically because of their culture what what message would you pass on actually the first part of my you know message will be my experience not coming out of the closet making that mistake hiding my sexuality to my mom to my parents to my family and uh, showing to the person that the most important part, and this is exactly what I tell, not just only to the rest of the letters of the queer community, even to the transgender community too as well. When I got them sitting on my office and they are looking for this exactly type of advice, is live your reality, live your truth. Do not be mm. afraid to be yourself. Mm. You know, you are beautiful. You are gorgeous. You are an extraordinary individual. And the world needs to see that because mm. you need to share that to the rest of the universe and to the rest of the humankind. Mm. <laughs> oh, yes. oh my God. Don't cry. <laughs> I'm not so bad. <laughs> Give me a, before we say goodbye, where can folks find you on your social media? Oh, absolutely. Every social media platform, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Grinder. No, I'm just joking. Google <laughs> Panda, my boyfriend. Ah! You know, <laughs> Cynthia Lee Fontaine at Gmail. Cynthia Lee Fontaine in every single social media platform. And even TikTok, you know, this all 170 years, you know, drag queen is on TikTok, you know, playing with all the kids. So yes. you can look me over there. <laughs> All right, we'll be in touch. Okay, Cynthia, so great talking to you today. We love you. Thank you, Cynthia. I love you guys. I love you guys so very much for this opportunity and thank you for this podcast interview. Yes, thank you. Los amo. Wow, <laughs> Matt, I'm like, I'm like filled with Cynthia Lee Fontaine goodness right Me now. Me too. Me too. Yeah. Yes, my cup runneth over. So what what's your hot message for the day? My hot message is that coming out is a process. We have to do it whenever it is right for us. We have to, we're the only ones that can know when that is. And when we do mm. take that leap, it is such an incredible thing to be able to step into who we are authentically. And also keep in mind, everybody, that even after we come out, there's still a significant impact of the experience of having to even be closeted. And so even though it's not covering up the fact that we're queer, however we identify, um, but in all the little ways that we might feel insecure and sheepish and, uh, you know, have our shit get stirred up. That that's, doesn't that's, go away. <laughs> that does, Just it doesn't come out. <laughs> but when we're aware of the fact that that stuff is still intrinsically tied to the experience of coming out okay. and the shame that that creates, then it helps us manage it so much better. So we just have to have an honest uh, kind of uh, take on that. And then we can uh, manage things a little bit better. Oh, that's really good. I got nothing to add to that. Come on, there's just, gotta be something. What's your thing? Okay, come on, right. come on, what's your hot message? Give us something, come on, piggyback. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, uh, 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 there's a price to be paid for not living your authentic self. Yeah. And I think you all, people, and coming out is a process for everybody. I, I would never tell people, force somebody to come out right. or uh, that's an individual decision. But I think everybody comes out when the price for not living your authentic life becomes too burdensome. Yes. Because that is a very heavy, burden mm -hmm. very you bear um where can people find you on your socials big <laughs> you can find me at mj dempsey psych on instagram and twitter and matthew j dempsey psychotherapy on facebook i want to have dinner with you i, I know you sometime let's do it i'm gonna be real shy in person i'm gonna be like <laughs> yeah but I then we'll have enough wine to cuddle and, and nap on the couch yes that's let's do that it's a date <laughs> you can find me at alec mappa on instagram facebook and twitter you can also listen to me every week i'm the official host of the rupaul's drag race official podcast uh wherever fine podcasts are sold if this is your first time uh download and subscribe if this is your time coming back we're so grateful that you chose to spend the week with us yes. your hour with us the week with us is going to be here all week <laughs> no be here next week for more hot mess fun we'll see you then bye bye guys